the main reason for writing the book was to provide a handbook for people that uh, had an interest in uh, furniture, who uh, were beginning uh, collectors, also for people running small restorations or, or uh, house museums and uh, wanted to know a little bit more about their collection, wanted to know whether a piece was appropriate to the period that they were trying to furnish the house in or a museum. And uh, I hope that this book uh, serves that purpose. The book, Three Centuries of American Furniture, written by Oscar Fitzgerald, Associate Director of the Navy Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. He's a graduate of Vanderbilt and Georgetown University, and he comes to Tennessee often because of Nashville and Mont Eagle family connections. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope. On one of Oscar Fitzgerald's visits to Mont Eagle, we talked about his book, especially all the illustrations in it. I had a contract to write the book, and the contract was for a year, and I did. I wrote the book in a year, and there was no problem. But the pictures took just about another year <laughs> to do. Really, the uh, concept of the editor was to have the pictures be sort of a book within a book, and that made it much more difficult. And I've tried to, in the um, captions about the pictures, be a little more informative than just to say this is a sofa from such and such a period. And uh, it made it harder, but I think it, it is an added dimension to the book. There are about uh, 520 pictures in the book, and the selection was uh, very difficult. One of the uh, things that I tried to do was to picture furniture that wasn't illustrated in most of the better-known publications. And uh, it turned out to be quite a hard thing to do. It's uh, very easy to use the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and they've got a very fantastic, uh, very complete collection of furniture and a very generous uh, photographic system. But when you use other pieces in uh, smaller collections or private collections, then you've got to, to evaluate the, those pieces of furniture and uh, it's not all done for you. But I did try to do that. I used a number of uh, pieces in the Washington area in private collections, and I tried to show ones that were not shown in other collections. Pieces also that were not maybe the, mo the most extraordinary example because those were owned by just the very top people, and uh, I tried to show examples that the more ordinary people would have. I also tried to uh, talk a little bit about furniture that was not the the most stylish furniture of the of the major style centers, but uh, the country furniture uh, furniture produced outside of these style centers. And I talk about Shaker furniture and Pennsylvania German furniture. I talk a lot about Southern furniture. There's an entire chapter devoted to that. Really, the scholarship at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. Uh, has reached the point where, again, some generalizations can be made about Southern furniture, which has not been the case up to this, to this period. So there's a whole chapter on that, which I'm very proud of. There's a great deal of interest in Shaker furniture in Tennessee, especially Shakers in Southern Kentucky. That's right. Many Tennesseans go there to see the furniture. Did you go there to I do there. your Yes, I have. I spent a very, very nice uh, couple of two days there, uh, not for this book. I actually I contacted them uh, for uh, trying to get some pictures of Shaker furniture, but they uh, didn't have uh, any available. Most of the uh, Shaker examples come from New England and some private collections in the Washington area. But there's a lot of interest in Shaker. Really, I th and I think it's kind of interesting. I think the reason for that is that uh, Shaker furniture today is more nearly like the modern aesthetic of very simple lines, and we res relate to that. And it's kind of interesting also that the Shakers were uh, working in a period where uh, this was uh, quite a, an unusual thing. The, the furniture was very elaborate, and in the contrast to the, to the simplicity of the Shakers being really ahead of their time in, the, in design, essentially. This book, Three Centuries of American Furniture, published in 1982 by Prentice Hall, covers the period from the 17th century when the earliest American furniture was made to the 20th century. And it was an outgrowth of a series of lectures by Oscar Fitzgerald at the Smithsonian Institution. The book was designed as a really a textbook for people interested in American furniture. Of course, 300 years of, of furniture, there were a number of styles, uh, a number of uh, uh, ways that the furniture was built, uh, the furniture evolved uh, over that period of time. And what I tried to do in the book was to uh, make a little sense of, out of that. Oscar Fitzgerald, author of Three Centuries of American Furniture. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the Nashville Chapter of the Tennessee Society of Certified Public Accountants. This is Lynn Folk.
A lot of things that, that you just can't even say in words can be expressed through an artistic medium. It, it seems to resolve something, at least within me. So that is why I'm so interested in this type of, of job where I can go out and talk to people about the arts, get them enthusiastic, uh, I hope that I can spread some of what I have gained on a personal level to other people. Barbara Arrowsmith, Executive Director of Tennesseans for the Arts. This is Lynn Folk as a Tennessee Kaleidoscope focuses on this recently formed and growing organization, which during the past year inaugurated events such as a reception for the members of the Tennessee General Assembly with arts and artists highlighted, issued a newsletter containing information about the state of the arts and what's being done, and is sponsoring statewide meetings of general concern to persons involved in the arts. Tennesseans for the Arts is the first attempt in Tennessee to unify all the people in the arts who are either arts organizations, individual artists, individuals who are interested in the arts, uh, support groups such as guilds, into one large body, mainly for networking purposes. We let our members know what is happening, we inform them, and we hope to get support then back so that they will talk to their legislators, so they will uh, question what is happening. The arts uh, typically are very laid back. People don't say much. Our big concern mm -hmm. is the state funding. You know, there are 56 constituencies in the United States. This includes territories, Washington, D.C., and of those, Tennessee ranks number 55 in per capita spending. A little over 11 cents per person is being spent on the arts in Tennessee. And if you figure in New York, it's almost $2 dollars. And Alaska is the highest, which is over $10 per capita. I think the quality of art in Tennessee and the participation is high. Maybe not monetarily, mm -hmm. but there's a great deal of interest. There's a in tremendous the arts. interest and unbelievable artists here. I think that we've, we've got just a, an incredible talent. Very, very fine, beautifully crafted folk type art, all the way through to very, very sophisticated avant garde type things. Same thing with the musicians, country music through the symphony orchestras, and they're all art. And I think that's one thing that people in the art world have got to realize, that there isn't a single one of these areas that is not an art form, that they're all expressions of human feeling. When we're talking about the arts, we're talking about all the arts. That's what's unique about this organization. It's the first attempt to pull together people from all the arts. We've got people uh, who are musicians, painters, sculptors, dancers, actors. Uh, then we've also got the people who teach these people. We've got the people who are the support groups of these people. So it's really exciting to see a network building of people who are really involved in the arts. Has any attempt been made to involve people that are not necessarily interested in the arts? Have you seen the poster, the Be a Fan of the Arts oh, yes. poster? Uh -huh. was, uh, it was designed and produced to be used you know, by Tennesseans for the Arts, and then the whole concept to be a fan of the arts was used for the arts conference back in November. It even has been in one national magazine. It was in Decorating and Craft Ideas for the January 84 issue. So we're getting requests for our poster nationwide. We've gotten them from California, the state of Washington, a lot from Texas, and one request from uh, Connecticut. And the fellow signed it. He says, I'm a Connecticut Yankee for the arts. Oh, how nice. <laughs> so we've gotten just a tremendous response. So we have gotten a lot of people who may not necessarily have wanted to join Tennesseans for the Arts because it was Tennesseans for the Arts, but when they saw that we had something that really promoted us in a unique fashion, then they joined. Barbara Arrowsmith, Executive Director of Tennesseans for the Arts. For information about membership, write to Tennesseans for the Arts, Box 2756, Nashville, 37219. This program made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. This is Lynn Folk.
I'm coming home to a melody of memories Front porch swings and dinner on the ground It warms my heart to know it's still awaiting Johnson County is everything you ever thought about small town living. Everybody gardens. You have trouble giving away the excess of your garden because everybody else has a garden. People visit, people walk, people sit on their front porch and swing. It's uh, your typical small town, southern small town. Mountain City in Johnson County, Tennessee, a pilot community for Tennessee Homecoming 86, which is the scene of an annual Burley Festival, a Bean Festival, and the home of lots of bluegrass music. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope with Judy McGuire of the Mountain City Chamber of Commerce, who is Homecoming Steering Committee Chairman for this town, which is located on the eastern border of the state. We're about as far east as you're going to find. We are in the corner of the state. We have access to North Carolina and Virginia and all the goodies that you can, you know, can find from those states. What is the population of Mountain City, approximately? Uh, the city is 2,100. The county is uh, 13 plus thousand. Uh, small, very small. So I imagine when you have the Burley Festival or any kind of a community affair like that, practically everyone turns out for it. Absolutely. Tell me about some of the arts activities that you have here. You have a museum or an art gallery or any kinds of arts uh, shows by local artists? Not uh, formal art shows by any means. What we do have is an extremely active historic society. Our county historic society is uh, very, very active. They have a world of artifacts, oh, some old furniture, uh, records, deeds, that sort of thing. Music, of course, this is bluegrass, a lot of primitive bluegrass here. We have um, some excellent musicians that play here. Some of them have even gone to New York and performed Radio City Music Hall. Their names? Oh, to, uh, Clint Howard and Fred Price. The story goes that when they were invited to a bluegrass festival many years ago, there were some people from Johnson County that lived in New York and heard they were coming through the grapevine and thought, well, those poor old boys, we better go down because there won't be a crowd, and got down there and couldn't get in the door. You know, it was packed. So uh, good musicians, really good ones. Mountain City in Johnson County is reviving two festivals from previous years, the Bean Festival and the Burley Celebration. This is our third annual Burley Festival. We celebrate tobacco. This is a big crop in, in uh, Johnson County. It's uh, eight or nine million dollars. Of course, tobacco I know is on the wane a little bit, so we're celebrating as fast as we can. Johnson County has been without a pageant of any sort for many years, so people are very responsive to our Burley Festival. We have a day of parade and, and food and crafts and exhibits and uh, bucking bronco and we got a hot air balloon. Are you going to be doing uh, something like this for Tennessee Homecoming 86? We are going to combine Tennessee 86 with the Burley Festival. Uh, the, we always have Burley in October, but in 86 we're going to move it all to July. We also used to be a real big bean uh, community here. Green beans were the big crop long before tobacco. And they used to have bean queens and bean, bean festivals and bean parades. So we were going to invite back all the bean queens. Um, and try to combine all the old uh, equipment uh, that they used in pictures and, uh, you know, for the nostalgia kick, and then incorporate the burly into it, too, what we did then, what we do now. We hope to have a weeks-long celebration, and rather than call it the Burley Festival or whatever, we're thinking in terms of just county fair, and we we're really wanting to get back to that. You have won some awards here in Mountain City, and tell me about those. Last year, Mountain City, Johnson County, won the Governor's Three Star Community Award, and that is for community development, uh, things we have done already, and uh, prospects for the future. Here in the county, we've got an industry called Iron Mountain Stoneware, and they uh, made a plate with the three stars on it and a tobacco leaf to, to commemorate that award. Judy McGuire in Mountain City, Tennessee, chairman of the Johnson County Steering Committee for Homecoming 86. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the Nashville chapter of the Tennessee Society of Certified Public Accountants. This is Lynn Folk. We're coming.
I remember years and years ago, it was as though we were a wasteland. But the talent was there, and it very often left, very often left to go to the East. New Orleans painter and sculptor Ida Kohlmeyer, whose retrospective show has been seen in Tennessee and is touring in other parts of the country. There's also an illustrated article about her and her work in a 1985 issue of Southern Accents magazine. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope with the artist as we looked at her work, completely extemporaneous, filled with clusters of objects, brightly colored, but always with some black. Throughout her 40-year career as an artist, which began at age 36, Ida Kohlmeyer has lived and worked in the South, in New Orleans, even though many of her contemporaries were leaving and going to New York or the East Coast. I was very tempted to do that around 1963. I had the great good fortune to be selected as one of the artists for the Cochrane Biennial in Washington. That was quite an achievement for a Southern woman at that time. And my agent in Washington urged me with all her might to pull up my roots and move to New York City where everything was at. Well, I thought very seriously about that, but my children were still young. I had a very happy marriage and happily still have. And I decided it might take years longer to so-called rise to the top, but I was willing to risk that. And you know, the wonderful thing is that museum curators and directors and all sorts of important people in the art world are coming to the South now, looking for talent because they know it's there. It's a very exciting thing. Would you have any particular message for artists in uh, Tennessee? I think what I would like any creative person to go away with after seeing my work would be the feeling of wanting to work themselves. That looking at my work would so energize them and, let's say, excite them, that it would give them an extra impetus to express themselves. Let me ask you about creativity. It's, it's not possible to be taught creativity, but it's also possible to build up creativity and bring it out. Yes, but not always in the classroom or by doing the activity, such as painting, which is what you want to do. You know, creativity can be induced by walking through a field of wheat or a pine grove or climbing mountains, doing anything, listening to music, watching ballet. That all is a nourishment for the creative person. And uh, I am often asked by mothers when to send their children to art classes. And I say never. I think the young can be so damaged by being told how and what to do. And I think adults can be damaged in the same way. That's why I stopped teaching. And the main thing is to try to urge people to see for themselves and put down what they see not what someone else has seen. You mentioned music and ballet and all of that. Do you listen to music when you paint? No, I don't. The only thing I listen to is my dog barking sometimes. <laughs> no, I love music so much. I like to be in, really involved in it, and it does distract me when I'm working. Ida Kohlmeyer, whose work may be seen in public, private, and corporate collections throughout the United States. Her retrospective show, organized by the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina, will travel through 1985 to Oklahoma, Alabama, Indiana, Louisiana, Texas, and North Carolina. This program made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. This is Lynn Folk. The Parthenon is surprisingly a very friendly building to actors and to theater, especially visually. 
Designing for the Parthenon sets is very different from designing for a stage, of course, because you're more decorating the building or creating a, a mood on the side of an existing structure. Once you get actors out there in the ancient Greek costumes with these huge set pieces that are built in scale to look correct with a Parthenon, visually it's wonderful. The perfect place for a Greek theater, Nashville's Parthenon in Centennial Park. Where the theater Parthenos plays have been presented, Oedipus the King in 1983, Medea in 1984, and there are plans for annual celebrations in Nashville with dramas such as these. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope with Theater Parthenos director Teresa Choate, a Tennessean now teaching at Rockmount College in Denver, Colorado, who's been coming back to Tennessee each summer for these productions. Having studied uh, drama first in Nashville, then in Washington and London, and acting in many stage productions, Teresa Choate decided that theater directing was her special interest. I have trained as a director, and I have a special love for the classics. Uh, I enjoy directing Shakespeare, and I enjoy the Greek tragedies and comedies as well. How I came to Greek theater was really just having always had a love of the Parthenon here in Nashville, and realizing one day that it would be an excellent place to produce the Greek plays because they aren't produced that much. And they are as exciting as any play that's ever been written. Some people compare them to soap operas. Their plots are so elaborate and so many really unbelievable things go on in these plays that I wanted to let the general public have a chance to really see what an incredible experience Greek theater can be. The park system is dedicated to continuing this project and over a gradual expansion to turn this into a major theatrical festival that hopefully will someday be known nationally. The Parthenon is so unique in itself and uh, having Greek theater here, that's the next best thing to having it in Greece, I would think. In, in Greece and in Athens, they do produce the Greek tragedies in and about the Acropolis and in the ancient amphitheaters. and. While I remember coming up with this idea about six years ago, my mother swears that 15 years ago when we were in Athens at the Acropolis, I said, somebody ought to do this in Nashville. <laughs> now she says I said that, I don't remember it. So perhaps that's true, that it's been resting in the back of my brain for that long. You had this idea when you were here in Nashville and then you left Nashville. And uh, how did you work your way back? Well, I did leave Nashville about I guess nine years ago now, to train in theater. And at the time I left, I had just finished working with the Metropolitan Park System. And they were so enthusiastic about the arts, which is so unusual for a city park system to support the arts as much as the park system does here. So when I did come back for one of my visits, I was going through the park with Wesley Payne, who's the curator of the Parthenon, talking about doing Shakespeare in the park. And we were walking by the Parthenon, and I looked up at this huge structure, and I grabbed Wesley and said, wait a minute, we're missing something here that's really obvious. <laughs> and that's really how, at least in my memory, uh, Greek theater came about here. And I love Nashville, and it's so exciting to be able to come back and to do something like this on the steps of the Parthenon. Each year, we really want to expand and improve this program until it is is the very best that we can make it. Well, I noticed uh, that you have benches all set up for the audience. It looks like you're expecting quite a crowd. Last year, we were so wonderfully happy by the response because when I came to do Oedipus the King, I really didn't know how people would react. But each night, the audiences grew. They were enthusiastic. What I especially loved was people who would be jogging through the park or walking their dogs or sweethearts hand in hand would suddenly stop and look up and see the show going on. And they would sit down and watch it all the way to the end because they wanted to. And that was exciting to have really free public theater and the public, at least from last summer, want it. And that's great. Teresa Choate, director of Theater Parthenos Summer Greek Theater, with its setting, the pillars and steps of Nashville's Parthenon. This program, Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. This is Lynn Folk.
music by the Cumberland Quintet from Cookville, Tennessee, in a showcase performance at the 1983 Tennessee Arts Conference in Nashville. This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope with Rebecca Nagel, professor of oboe at Tennessee Tech, who is currently principal oboist with the Tech Community Symphony and oboist with the Cumberland Quintet. This musical group is in residence at Tennessee Technological University in Cookville and performs frequently throughout the state and elsewhere. Cumberland Quintet's been in existence for 11 seasons now, and all the members are full-time members at Tennessee Tech University on the music faculty. The other members of the group are Robin Fellows, flutist, Dan Hearn plays clarinet, Arthur Labar is the horn, Player with us, and David Rayshore is our bassoonist. We play at least once a quarter on campus, three quarters in a year, of course, and we also perform quite frequently in area public schools. We did a tour to um, Upper East Tennessee, and we also try to do as many outside concerts as, as we can. Have you done anything outside of the state? We performed at the regional conference for the College Music Society, and that took place in Gainesville, Florida. We did travel down there and played a couple concerts on the way also. We're also becoming more active in the Tennessee Arts Commission, and we're on their approved touring list. So we hope to be doing some more work around the state through the Arts Commission. Tell me about the selections that you play. We try to play a broad spectrum of music, and we play anything from lighter pieces to very uh, heavy contemporary pieces. Um, one particular piece that seems to go over well with audiences is a piece called by Berio called Opus Zoo. As well as playing, we also speak in that piece. It's very entertaining. It tends to go over real well. What was the name of the selection you played for the conference? It was the Shostakovich, I think. Right. It's an arrangement of the Shostakovich polka from his Golden Age Ballet arrangement. It was originally written for an orchestra and this arrangement is for Woodwind Quintet. We play it quite often and um, it, it gets a good response. It's very lively and, and moves along. We were talking earlier about the members of your quintet. What was it you said you played with and then tell me what some of the other people, uh, what musical organizations they play with. We all play in the Tech Community Symphony, which is a local symphony which puts on three, four concerts a year and we all are members of that, principal players in that, and then all of us do quite a bit of extra playing. I and myself and our clarinetist, Dan Hearn, and the horn player, Arthur Labar, and also our bassoon player, David Racher. we've all played in the Nashville Symphony, substituting now and then, and our flutist plays second flute in the Knoxville Symphony on a regular basis, so we all try to stay as active as we can. Together, we all hold degrees from some very fine music schools, among them uh, Indiana University, um, the Cleveland Institute of Music, the Yale University School of Music, and North Texas State University. And which one of those applies to you? I got a master's degree at Yale University School of Music there. Rebecca Nagel, oboist with the Cumberland Quintet, based at Tennessee Tech in Cookville. This program made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. This is Lynn Folk. I'm just not sure that the historians can ever do quite the job that the writer of fiction can do. There's some very good histories of, of Nashville. But then finally, I, well, as a teacher of English, I, I have to go on the side of creativity, uh, poetry and, and fiction. And I hope that uh, fiction catches the essence mm -hmm. of the city. The essence of the city of Nashville, captured in the novel Faces in a Nashville Arcade. 
This is Lynn Folk for Tennessee Kaleidoscope with author uh, Dr. Herschel Gower of the Vanderbilt University English Department as we discuss the many different arcades referred to in his book. Actually, I'm talking about uh, arcades in general. There is a famous Nashville arcade which opened up about 1903 and is still there. I'm talking about a very classical arcade four sides running around the Parthenon, beautiful columns. And I'm also talking about uh, an old theater here, the Vendome Theater. You bought your ticket on the outside, and you walk down a long passageway. And on each side of that passageway, that sort of arcade, were large photographs of all the MGM stars, uh, from Greta Garbo, uh, Joan Crawford, Freddie Bartholomew, even down to Lassie. So I'm, I'm talking about arcades in general and passageways in general. The cover of the book has a young man of 17, the protagonist of the story, looking down the long classical arcade at the Parthenon. And it is Nashville indeed because he's eating a goo-goo, a Nashville candy bar, which originated here at about the turn of the century and still going strong. So here we have a kind of contrast between the classical uh, Greek and a kid with his sleeves rolled up eating a goo-goo, uh, looking at a kind of uh, infinity at the end of this arcade. And I won't give the story away, but uh, right at the very end of the novel, this young protagonist, uh, Clark Templeton, drives a 1929 pickup truck right down the arcade, careening from one side to the other. Something, incidentally, that I've always wanted to do but never dared do. This book is fictional, then? The book is fiction. I insist that the characters are fictional. I insist that the incidents are fictional. The setting is definitely Nashville. One of my earlier readers the manuscript said, now, we, we can understand and appreciate Clark Templeton. He's 17. He's going through a weekend of uh, all kinds of crises, etc. But said, you know, Nashville, the city, is as strong a character in this book as Clark Templeton. And uh, one of my critics, uh, Mr. Charles Scribner said uh, it evoked uh, Nashville in the 1930s to me very clearly and very strongly. And he said, I, I've never been to Nashville. So I hope I've, I've created a sense of the city, a portrait of, of a city, which I love very much. I would assume that this book is filled with a lot of things that maybe you would have liked to have done, and maybe some that you actually did. You've hit a, a very strong point there. Um, People write for all sorts of reasons, and the protagonist, Clark Templeton, has got a name that I like. Uh, he's got blonde hair. When I was 17, I was brunette, and my hair was very unruly, and I, I wanted blonde hair and blue eyes, you see. That's one of these things that, that uh, teenagers worry about. You, you want things quite different from the way they actually are, and so... He has uh, blue eyes and blonde hair, and he doesn't look like me at all. He looks like somebody I'm, I might have wanted to be. Dr. Herschel Gower's novel, Faces in a Nashville Arcade, published by the Graphic Press, is set in Nashville in the 1930s, but it involves characters, romances, conflicts, and concerns which were not only universal then, but they still are. Tennessee Kaleidoscope, made possible with the joint support of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the Nashville Academy of Medicine. This is Lynn Folk.